my senses with magical deeds. La 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 la. Hello, I'm Todd Martin. I'm the director of music at a church where in March of last year I had the occasion to play orchestra bells for a few Lent services. Not being a trained percussionist, I found that I wasn't quite hitting all the notes correctly, despite the fact that I had written the music myself. So I asked myself, how nice would it be to be able to play the bells via a piano keyboard rather than trying to hit the notes with little tiny balls on the ends of sticks called mallets. The instrument that I was thinking of had already been invented. It was conceived by Victor Moustel in France in the year 1880 and was constructed of struck tuning forks that had a very similar sound to that of a toy piano that we know today. It was a pleasant enough sound but it just wasn't loud enough to be heard in ensembles. This is a tuning fork similar to what he may have used and I'll strike it here with the mallet. And as you can hear, it's not very loud. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to attach it to a piece of wood here, which will enhance the sound a little bit. And you can hear the difference. A little louder. But still, it wasn't loud enough to be used anywhere, basically besides out of the home. A few years later, in 1886, Victor's son, Auguste, decided to improve upon the design. He replaced the tuning forks with struck metal plates, which improved the sound greatly. So next to me, I have a set of orchestra bells, which I'm going to hit the same note as the tuning fork, and you can hear the difference. A much more rounded, pleasant tone. So this new instrument, which had a very ethereal and celestial sound, was then to be called the Celeste in France, commonly today known as Celesta, as pronounced in Italian. In doing some research, I learned that there's actually only two manufacturers who make Celestas today. There's Scheidmeyer in Germany, and also the Yamaha Corporation, which is based in Japan. So a 2013 catalog of Yamaha's orchestral instruments has a list price of their least expensive Celesta selling for $13,000. That was way out of my price range, so what I decided to do was to build my own. So the following is a photo documentary of the construction, engineering, and building process of my homemade Celesta. I hope you enjoy watching. I began by looking at different existing designs of Celestas. This is an illustration of one of the very first Celestas. And here's an earlier horizontal design. This is a more modern 20th century design. And finally, here's an example of the most contemporary model, which is available today from Yamaha. I started with a Schoenhut toy piano and a Ludwig Glockenspiel bell kit both of which I completely disassembled. The first step was to piece together a prototype, experimenting with different key and hammer heights, so that the chimes would be stricken at precisely the right spot in order to produce the most pleasant tone as possible. Notice the red hymnal below the key bed, which by chance was exactly the right size. With the key bed now attached to a permanent wood base, I then placed all the keys onto the balance rail to check the fit. As you can see, the plastic keys that came with the piano are hollow, and they were very flimsy to the touch. So I added Jarus key leads that I had left over from a piano project to each key, giving them some substance and weight. This eliminated the cheap toy piano feel and gave them a greatly improved touch and response. However, the added weight made the keys very unacceptably noisy. So I removed the keys and then layered rubber silicone and wool felt below where each key came into contact with the wood. The keys were still very clunky and a bit unstable, so I filed each guide on the rail for a better fit, adjusting the width to fit each key. 
I then placed quilting baffling in between each rail guide, and that improved the overall action greatly. I also noticed a thump when each hammer came back to rest on the key. So I added a piece of leather to each hammer and key where they met at their resting positions. The end result was a keyboard that felt nice, and more importantly, now was quiet. The next step was to space the hammers. <coughs> the next... <coughs> the next step... Ah, there we go. I don't know what that was all about. Anyway, the next step was to space the hammers on the hammer rod so that they aligned with the chimes that would be placed vertically on a frame behind them. I used front rail felts and cardboard balance rail bushings from my piano regulation kit as spacers, which worked perfectly. Next, I built a hangrail for the chimes, measuring exactly the same distance between each metal bar so that they could be hung as closely together as possible without affecting the tone. The next task was to calculate the angle of the hangrail for the chimes without compromising the sweet spot in which the hammers would strike the tone bars. Note the tiny dots on the chimes that I used to mark the hammer's striking point. In this picture, you'll notice that every other hammer is offset from the next. That's because in order to make this instrument as small and portable as possible, I decided to construct two ranks of chimes so that every other note in the chromatic scale would be struck alternately by the front and back rows of hammers. This is the back rank of chimes, which are struck by the row of hammers that you see closest to them. The next and most difficult undertaking of this whole project was calculating the angle and installing the hangrail for the second or front rank of chimes. The placement of the hammer rod was critical so that the hammers not only struck at the proper spot, but also at as similar of an arc to the back rank as possible so that the touch of keys and the tone of each rank were as closely matched as possible. With the top rail and the hammer rod now in place, I then cut and installed the bottom rail for the front rank of chimes. I then put the row of chimes for the front rank into place. I left the bottom holes of the chimes unsecured just in case I needed to make any adjustments later on. That turned out to be a wise move. No, they're not organ pipes. Well, you're a little bit closer, and that may just be my next project, however, it's neither. As in a marimba, a xylophone, and in vibraphones, and in this case a celesta, these are called resonator tubes. The tubes are cut to specific lengths and then tuned to resonate at the same frequency as the chimes, which multiplies their amplitude and gives them a warmer, more focused timbre. I spent several days cutting, trimming, filing, and sanding several different diameters and lengths of PVC pipe in order to get them just right. I was finally able to fine tune each tube to its corresponding chime by adjusting the elbows slightly up or down until they matched the pitches perfectly. I knew of this oral phenomenon but I was truly amazed at the difference the resonators made once I put them into place. This picture shows both ranks of the chimes installed from the back of the instrument. You can see the divots in the backs of the chimes from where I fine-tuned each tone bar. I'm a certified piano tech and I tune pianos part-time. So even though they were close in pitch, they had to be perfect for me. Here you can see the back, 
and the front shelves that I now have installed for the resonator tubes just below the felt dampers. These shelves will support the elbows of the resonator tubes once they're installed. As in this example, the resonator tubes in a conventional Celesta are pointed downward and hidden inside the cabinet below the keyboard. But in order to make my instrument more portable, I decided to design my tubes going upward, more like this. With the action and mechanics now all in place and working like a charm, it was now time to start enclosing the case. With little to no experience in woodworking or cabinet making, I was definitely in for a challenge here. With the help and guidance of my new friends at the local woodcraft shop, I was able to get the proper tools and materials that I needed to begin this part of the project. After a few cuts, I was able to- Wait! Don't you mean after a few dozen cuts? After all, I was sitting on your shoulder for the whole project. You made me your gopher, so I know! Yes, after a few dozen cuts and adjustments, I was able to nicely fit the front, the center, and the back vertical pieces into place. Here's the front view with the pieces set into place. Then after a bit more measuring and trimming, the puzzle pieces all fit well and I was able to start framing things out. Here's the same shot, but from the back. Note the faint pencil marks on the back piece, which will eventually become tone holes lined up with the chimes inside the cabinet. This is how the back piece turned out, with the tone holes drilled. I had all the vertical pieces constructed, so now it was time to paint them. Here you can see the cabinet pieces lying out, spray painted glossy black and left for curing overnight. The backboard with tone holes, the front, the music rack, the key slip, and the custom key blocks. Oh, and this is my 14-year-old black lab named Mitty. He likes to sniff paint fumes. As a part of making everything pretty before the final assembly, I painted the white PVC resonator tubes with a gold metallic finish. If you look far into the background of the picture, you can see my 1886 J&C Fisher upright piano that I refurbished last year. Here's a closer shot for you. And here, off to the left hand side, I have an 1881 Chicago Cottage pump organ that will be one of my spring projects. It spent over a hundred years providing music in a Methodist church in rural West Virginia and made its way here to Tucson via the last organist's granddaughter. It came into my hands about a year ago and I'm really looking forward to bringing it back to its original playing condition so that it can be enjoyed for another 100 years. Okay, well back to the Celesta here. Here you can see it's now starting to take shape and look like a real instrument. I have the front board and center divider in place. Now for the hard part. Wait, I thought you said before that... <coughs> I thought you... <coughs> <clears throat> I thought you... Ah, there we go. I don't know what that was all about. Anyway, I thought you said that calculating and installing the hang rod for the second rank of chimes was the most difficult task of this whole project. That's what you said before. Well, you sure don't miss a thing. Anyway, yes, that is what I said. But what I should have said was that that part was the one that took the most time. This next step is the one that took the most patience. Well, okay. So the religious board that you see here, the holy one, is the top piece for the front rank of chimes that will eventually hold the resonator tubes in place where they protrude from the cabinet. Not only are the front and back ranks of the chimes at different relative levels, but their corresponding resonator tubes are also at completely different angles from each other and with the chimes behind them. On top of that, each rank of chimes has two different diameters of tubing running from the base to the treble. A geometrical challenge. Here you can see the markings for one of the two rank tops. This shows the front rank resonators in place with an open-faced back 
covered with gold mesh, which will help with the sound coming out. Here you can see the back rank resonators in place with the back of the toy piano cabinet jigsawed off so that it will be flush with the rest of the cabinet. And then here is the back of the cabinet installed with both tops that cover the resonators. I finished the sides with leather. I also had a brass plate made with a description of the instrument. And then I added some natural cedar trim to the tops and sides and then splurged on some ornamental wood inlay that I installed around the keyboard to make it more attractive. And this is the finished product. I completed it just in time to be used for two Christmas time services this year. It definitely added a special touch to the carols and hymns and sounded lovely, if not magical, above the organ, flutes, brass, and the chancel choir. And now I bet you'd like to hear what this instrument sounds like, right? Okay then, are you ready, Todd? Here's a little bit of Silent Night that we played by candlelight for Christmas Eve service. some Brahms that you might be familiar with. Some Bach. sort of. And finally, a sampling of the most famous Celesta piece. Thanks for taking time to watch my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to leave a comment below or on Facebook. I'd love to hear from you. And that's all, folks.